All right. So my name is Felicity Howard, and I'm joined this evening with my co-chair for the Sociology and Anthropology Student Association at Carleton University, um, Jamie Chigaranga. And we are joined this evening with Neil K. Campbell and Geraldine King, who were super excited to be with us this Valentine's Day. Um, we just want to thank everybody for joining us and for everybody else who's watching this like later on um, on YouTube. Just thank you so much for joining this space and taking part in this conversation with us this evening that we're super excited for. So we're just going to start right away and dive in and um, turn things over to Jordan. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, you know, half of you might be my students that this is our usual lecture time. Uh, so I'm really excited for that. But I've been asked to kind of talk a little bit about the land. And um, I, I think a lot of us have this issue with like an acknowledging the land. Um, because that might be something that's just not meaningful and not really thorough when it comes to like interacting with the land around us. And, you know, one thing I heard a long time ago that really resonates with me is this idea that we can't acknowledge the land because the land has to acknowledge us first. So in thinking about where we're gathering from here today, it's like virtual and, and what have you. A lot of you might be in Ottawa. A lot of you might be around, um, around the country. And I see already some of you from BC and, and Saskatchewan. So, so thinking about where I'm streaming from right now, Omama Winnewak, which is the, the land of the Algonquin people, Algonquin Nishnabek. What I've always been taught is that we, when we come to these territories, whether we belong to them, whether we are, these are our homelands, we always have to ask ourselves, like, what can we do while we're here to make this land better? And that's not to suggest that like the land is in any sort of deficit that we're, we, we're humans and we're inevitably gonna make it better. But we have to think about while we're here, whether we're a guest, a visitor, uninvited like people like to say visitor but it's kind of like well were you invited here like are you really a visitor so really thinking about as you're in these lands that belong to indigenous peoples what can you do while you're here to make those lands better so for me i'd like to think about me being here as um, a long time person that's lived worked and played in omama winamakin i think about you know um trying to learn the language so i'm ojibwe nishnabe but Algonquin is kind of like, you know, a, a similar, it comes from the same family tree, um, you know, and, and trying to think about the ways that when I refer to places in this space, I refer to them in the language that Algonquin Nishnabek intended for it to, to, um, to be described as, or the way that this land intended for itself to be described as, and we acknowledge it in that way. And because it's Valentine's Day and we're talking about like, like love and, and relationality, I also had a child that uh, is Algonquin. So I, I'm doing my part, folks, I'm doing my part. So <laughs> in thinking of that, I just want everybody to, instead of just acknowledging the land as like, hey land, what's up, I'm here. I just wanna encourage everybody to think about the lands that you occupy at this very moment in this place, space and time, um, unless you're indigenous, belong to someone else. So just consider and reflect upon what you're doing in your everyday lives to, to make that land better or to make the facilitation of people's, of Indigenous people's connections to that live, to that land better. So having said that, this is why I'm, I'm live streaming from Omama Winnemuckin, which is the unceded and unsurrendered um, territory of the Algonquin, Algonquin peoples. So, um, so yes just my point of uh, reflection for you all is to remember that we can't acknowledge the land before it acknowledges ourselves. So miigwech. Thank you so much, Jordan. Um, yeah, <clears throat> a lot of important points for us to consider. Um, do you want to maybe start by uh, talking a bit about like, your research um, and then we'll pass it over to Tineo um, to introduce herself? Okay, sure. So I don't want to take up like too much time because I feel like I talk about myself all the time um, in my class and my work. I really want to give the space for um, Tanil to shine, although she doesn't really need to be given space because she just shines anyways. And I don't mean I don't mean just in a little greasy way. I mean like just just in essence. So I'm Geraldine King. I'm Nishnabe. I'm from Kashkazaging Nishnabek, which is uh, a small community, a small first nation. Um, 
about two hours north of Thunder Bay, Ontario. I live and work in Ottawa. I'm a faculty member in the School of Indigenous and Canadian Studies, and I work a lot in this idea of Nishnabek love works, but the way that, I guess, in English, we, we call it erotics, but the way that that type of expressing ourselves and coming to know one another in the sense of love and love works really diminishes or takes back the settler colonial pervasive like policing of our own bodies and the way that um, Canadian nation building has relied upon uh, transforming the ways that we engage with one another, that we act in relation to one another, and that really like we we enter into intimate kinship with one another. So I look at this through the lens of like Nishnabe epistemologies and phenomenologies and really trying to remember a lot of what's been forgotten, but still exists through the way that we tell stories and sing songs and and um, and enter into that type of literary relationship with one another. So basically all I'm trying to say is like, I read and write bush porn. So <laughs> that's the like essence of what what I do as um, as somebody that is trying to to revive the ways that I always heard my aunties and my own grandmother and the women in my family discussing um, the way it means to be Nishnabe in an intimate sense. So so you know, of course, Tanil is like one of the like bastions of all of this and um me she's already yeah. <laughs> her books are assigned to my courses because of course uh right now i'm teaching decolonizing sex gender and sexualities so uh i'm i'm so happy that she's able to be here because of course everybody's just gonna be blown away by her so i want to pass it to you to neil um <laughs> yeah and I'm like, and I gotta go. <laughs> um, um, as some of you know, my name is Tino Campbell. I'm Denny from English River First Nation, which is located in Northern Saskatchewan in Treaty 10. And I am the big M Métis, the Red River Métis from the Batash region on my mother's side, political. And <laughs> I currently attend the University of Saskatchewan at Saskatoon in Treaty 6. And that's kind of how I met Jimmy back in the day. Oh, academics bring us together and tear us apart. Ugh. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm in my PhD studying Indigenous women's erotica in Canadian literature. And I won't go too much more into that specifically because I don't know. It keeps changing. The more that I read, I'm in that process of I'm reading the field. And then my ideas change as the field develops. And I was like, this is why people, academia like kills us because we constantly want to keep up and like, this is brilliant. Someone so is brilliant. I need to incorporate that. But if you're constantly doing that, your thesis is never going to get, get finished. Anyways, what I'm saying is don't go into academia unless you want to devote the next five to six years of your life in the library. <sighs> I don't know. But that's me. Um, on the artistic side, I'm also a poet, as we sometimes know. My first book is uh, Hashtag Indian Love Poems, and it came out in 2017. Thank you, Jibbe. Thank you. And my second book is Nadi Nazu, which means good medicine. And that just came out. And <laughs> thank you, guys. <laughs> that just came out in 2021, last March, actually, my birthday month. I know, I tell everybody that <laughs> March is my birthday month in case you're wondering. <laughs> Celebrate yourself, you guys, it's important. And um, so I'm a poet. Uh, the first two collections are definitely about indigenous erotica, body, land, sexuality, friendship, kin, etc. And I'm also a photographer. I do this uh, thing called Sweet Moon Photography. I've been photographing indigenous love and indigenous people for the last decade and it, it fills my soul, you know. Um, I think photography is so important for Indigenous people, for us to reclaim our images and our visual stories and to reclaim that narrative. And I'm so proud that I'm able to do it and be welcome into so many communities. It makes my heart, my heart solid and I can go through it. And then what else do I do? Sometimes I blog. Um, I started this collection called Tea and Bannock, which is for Indigenous women photographers. 
there's all this narrative, um, the big magazines for indigenous men, um, which is great and lovely and I'm happy for them. But as a woman, as a femme, I'm very interested in women's narratives. And I should mention that my woman is inclusive. I'm including queer, I'm including two-spirit, I'm including trans, I'm including anyone who identifies with this idea of femme. So saying that, and I really wanted a place where we could talk about that without having to explain the niche, the cultural niches that being an Indigenous woman has. You know, I don't want to explain Bannock slaps to everybody. I don't want to explain why hickeys are a love story. Like, <laughs> I just want people who got it. So we created this space called Team Bannock in 2016. And it really took off. It was really supported. And then as we all just kind of like developed into more mature artists and mothers and partners and businesswomen, um, it's definitely slowed down. So right now it's this, I'll say, archival collection. And I'm trying to decide what we should do with it. Should we make it into a coffee table book? Like I want to honor this woman. So it's really interesting having digital space, but wanting to transform it into like a physical space. And what else can I say about me to set the scene? Oh, I'm a mother. Um, I don't often talk about that for some reason, but I am. And uh, I have a 10 year old daughter. She is basically my twin. Um, I found a picture of me when I was 10 year olds old and I found a picture of her. And um, it was really weird, like a copy and paste that I've never seen that version of her before. And I was like, oh, she is mine. <laughs> so it was really beautiful and kind of humbling to say to see the genetics passed down because I've always felt like, my mom is so beautiful and now it's just like oh I guess I'm beautiful too like my mom and my daughter <laughs> it's just great and what else I'm just gonna give you guys like this flush because I know Jibby and I are just gonna like go off into the world with this <sighs> do we have any guiding questions or any starting questions Jibby? Yeah, I, have a, I can like start like you off. Both. Thank you yeah. both for that introduction. Um, you're both beautiful people. And I'm like really grateful to be here today and listen to you both. Um, so just to start us off, I guess, um, as a lot of us know, there are like many different sources of love, whether they're other humans, um, non-human beings, um, things that exist beyond like the physical sense. Um, so by recognizing these other um, like sources of love and like relations we can have. Um, how do those like, how would you kind of describe that these influences, like influences our idea of like being alone or like single versus like being coupled, especially on like a day like this today? And it's not directed towards either of you. So if either one of you want to start off, please feel free. Oh. Okay, she handed, she handed it over to me. So, so you know, I handed it over to you because we have very <laughs> different perspectives. I know this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tanil messaged me one time. She's like, "What the fuck are eco karate? Are you eco erotics?" <laughs> so yeah. So she'll have a different perspective. So you know, I think that um, I had a discussion about this uh, just just recently regarding you know entering into intimate relationships and possibly erotic relationships with non-human um, people, right? So the essence of that is thinking about, we have to think through consent and we have to think through the ways that, um, that we can meaningfully and, and kind of, um, I guess, intimately create relations. So, so, so I, I turn this always back to Melissa K. Nelson, who talks about eco-erotics as this way to um, deconstruct the essentialization of our bodies as these mere subjects of like capitalism and this leo, uh, neoliberal subject that just constantly has to reproduce, whether that's like reproducing labor or reproducing actual physical like human beings that will end up being parts of the labor uh, regime, right? But if we can deconstruct the way that we um, reflect upon or we engage with reproduction, then I really think that there's a fundamental um, possibility 
for humanity to kind of um, transform into something that like doesn't rely upon just our labor as human beings, right? So I know I'm kind of like going like sideways on this conversation, but in, in thinking about, so Melissa K. Nelson talks about if we can reflect upon the way that we engage with the environment around us, with the, with the world around us in an Anishinaabeg, like eco-erotic sense, it doesn't necessarily mean sexualizing um, uh, the world around us. It means deconstructing the ways that humans have been propped up as the only purveyor of reproductive like wealth and um, legitimacy. So we enter into these like intimate relationships with the world around us as a means of almost like humbling ourselves and not propping up humanity as the ultimate like be all and end all of what it means to exist in to the future and also as like um, a subject of history. So yeah, I know, I know Tanil and I have had these conversations quite a lot um, about what it means to have non-humans recognize us and us recognize non-humans back as um, intimately connected. Um, but I think that there's a lot of power in that. So I'd like to hear what uh, Tanil has to say. Every time you start talking about eco erotics, I'm just like, A, you're brilliant. And B, I'm lost. Yeah. And it's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. No, I always feel like I'm learning more. Um, but I'm going to go the other way <laughs> and talk about <laughs> relationships with uh, or lack thereof relationships. Um, as we said, we know today is Valentine's Day. It's great to be discussing ideas of love and relationships and sexuality and sensuality um, today, but um, I was like, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> My auntie's coming through. I'll tell you a story. Yes. Um, I've been like happily single, literally very, very happily single for like the last eight years since I broke up with my long-term partner. And over the last year or two, I've definitely noticed as we've gotten older, I'm turning 38, my birthday month next month. Um, <laughs> but as we've gotten older, that um, the women in my life are, I want to say like not setting me up, but like showing this very concerned attitude for my singleness. Mm -hmm. And it's also made me laugh because I'm never the person to be bemoaning Valentine's Day. You know, like don't have a partner, buy myself something. Um, the lack of partner has never defined me. And having a partner has never defined me. And I'm very lucky that way. Like I'm very lucky that way. Because I understand a lot of people and especially a lot of women and femmes that this idea of partnerhood is one of the markers of both your ability to be a good person, a good mother, a good partner. You know, this idea of being in a solid monogamous two-person relationship defines you as a good person in society and I'm just like <laughs> <"Hell."> uh, <laughs> and in the last couple of years um uh I have this this ex in my life I call the ghost every three or four years he'll show up he'll dm he'll text he'll say hi and you know we broke up and it was it was a very clean breakup and it was like nothing scandalous or scary but every like three or four years, he'll show up and he'll want to date or he'll want to go to the movies or he'll want to like play Nintendo. Super chill. And like we're friends and I don't think anything of it. And then he disappears again. And I was telling my friend, uh, one of my best friends, Diana, this about the ghost. And she was like, Tania, like, you know, I think it's just been too long. And I think like actually um, it's time that you open your heart up and it's time that you let somebody in or it's time that you accept a partner. And this seems like if he keeps coming around like this, it seems like he wants to be there. And I'm like, oh yeah, he does totally. And then she's just like, well, why don't you like accept him? And I was like, why should I? Like, all you know about him is that he keeps coming around. <laughs> and it got me thinking about how for her, like having a partner was one of those foundations that she needed and wanted because she's never been single. And for me, like, don't get me wrong, prior to this long, this breakup, I, I definitely did around, I always had a boyfriend. But as I think we've grown older, 
settling into I'm not gonna say singlehood because in no way do I like feel single like I have very rich fulfilling relationships they're just not what's traditionally defined as like a romantic monogamous two people relationship and I'm always like what is single because I'm not sure I fit that definition right now and even when I do date I don't necessarily think if I fit the relationship definition either. And whose definitions are these? And how did we define ourselves prior? Because, you know, I know the old stories. I know the old Denny stories and the old Cree stories. <laughs> and I know the kind of power that women had over these relationships. And <sighs> back to the main point. I don't know what the main point is. It is a confusing time. <laughs> it's a confusing time, but it's also a powerful time, I think. I think we're in a presence of people being able to redefine what our emotional and romantic and sexual and mental needs are and realizing that the idea of one person fulfilling all of those is a fantasy. Mm-hmm. Is that like stab Walt Disney in the leg? Uh- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think, yeah, Tanil, you're bringing up so much right now. So, you know, I always grew up with this idea that, or this notion that when Nishnabek women, like, or, or whoever were entering into these intimate relationships, it was, it was not necessarily considered something that was like lifelong. Because I think, you know, you mentioned that there was this, um, there's this fragility, right? So when, when there's this solid kind of relationship that people can read and assume that is going to benefit um, I would say like this capitalist patriarchal sense of what it means to be in relation, right? That's relying upon like solid um, partnerships that won't undermine what it means to like go to work every day or whatever, right? So we grew up with this like idea that if a woman like married someone and and I want to also like... Um, trouble this idea that only men can have multiple partners right like I think it's really important to to acknowledge that that in our societies and in our in our traditions there was a there was an idea that women can also have like multiple partners right and if a woman for instance I always heard this that if a woman like just got sick of her man she could just like instead of going through this whole like troublesome onerous expensive like divorce proceedings she just like dropped his moccasins outside the wigwam and was like okay that's it when he comes back he's gonna realize like okay time to move on to the next wigwam time to like find my own wigwam like like whatever but but I want to ask you to if it's okay because we we're having this conversation especially in my class right now is what do you think about how colonialism or settler colonialism relies upon especially indigenous women not entering into like kind of multiple relationships whether that's sexual or loving or platonic like what's kind of at stake if indigenous women only stay with one person presumably like not another woman (sighs) well this whole idea (laughs) I don't want to seem like I'm like I don't want to like regurgitate, like you've said it, um, this whole idea of like one and one, man and woman, forever and ever. That's very European, it's very colonialist. It's very not necessarily belonging to us. Not to say we didn't have those relationships, Mm -hmm. but you know, there's a lot more leeway for growth for the idea that people and personalities change, that big events affect us and we react differently at like, And I think this idea of not allowing women the knowledge, the grace, the historical understanding that we too were able and are able and should continue to be able to have multiple partners is tied into this idea of patriarchy and men's power. I think it's a diminishing of women's inherent ability to love without limit. Um, This idea that if we love one partner, it doesn't mean we love the other one less. I feel, and I'm like generalizing it, so shoot me. I feel like men (laughs) don't 
are raised in such an environment that this idea of generosity of spirit and love and grace is a competition. This is my first girl. This is my sneaky link. This is my side. This leveling of relationships that they already have. Whereas I feel, and again, generalizing, that women understand that we can love in different ways, but that doesn't have an equality to it. It's just a different love. The way I love my sister is different than the way that I love my brother. It's different than the way that I love my lover. It's different than the way that I love my ex-boyfriend from two years ago. It doesn't make one better or worse than the other. It's just this capacity for love and understanding that it's it's there and it's not something to be diminished. And I think, again, if we give, if there was that presence to give women and understand women on that level, I think putting the foot back on the men would be like, have to be capacity for growth that maybe they're not ready for yet. Maybe that we're not ready to challenge those social structures yet. But um, fuck waiting for men. Like, Valentine's Day is spicy. What's that? Yeah. I was like, Valentine's Day is spicy. <laughs> All spiced up. You go for your fucking mental health walk yet, or what? <laughs> In your snowshoes. <laughs> um, we love our mental health walks. Yes, and we love our men too. So, so I guess yes. the question is, as a uh, sort of thinking through the ways that patriarchy and hetero paternalism and this like toxic masculinity um, imposes the sense of the ways that men are expected to like inhabit the spaces of love, right? And I think you're, I think that's where you're going is like women are expected to be more um, intimate and kind of insecure maybe and, and, and sensual in ways that are like policed at sometimes, but also rewarded in others. So mm -hmm. I often think about the ways that like indigenous men have had that capacity to explore all of these essences of being truly good lovers, whether that's sexual or emphatic or like intimate or whatever stripped away from them um, because of Indian Act policies, for example, right? So if we if we specify that in terms of like land, right? So so I think everybody here has heard the term and maybe and and maybe enacted it yourself, like land lord. But that was always through this history and genealogy of like white Eurocentric like paternalism a man that like manages this land so I'm wondering and it, you know as we're reading your books Tanil, we we see a lot of like references to land and like taking back land one white man at a time type of a thing so I'm wondering like I'm wondering how you in your writing and like how you think about the ways that like land back is also a method or an energy that indigenous and ind indigenous men and and kind of um people you know people on the on, uh, masculine people are able to like re-enable that sense of sexual sensuality and and um intimacy that has been um stripped from them oh you're so good at this <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, like, yes, yes, land and sexuality and body are definitely intertwined and entwined and one in my books. And I actually like, weirdly enough, weirdly enough, I had never even noticed it because it was so intuitive to me until somebody else had pointed this out. And I was like, wow. <laughs> So like, it's, it's a recent exploration, but it's this idea that, um, yes, I'll make the tongue in cheek jokes about like, when you fuck a, oh, like, when you fuck a white guy, like ask for reparations, like land back, ha 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 ha. And it's like a dark, dark humor. Um, but for me, like land back takes, place in two different ways both in my poetry and in the life and in the sexuality because land back in the north does not necessarily mean land back it means going back to the land 
and land back in these urban environments with people who don't look like you and don't sound like you and don't have your accent and don't like smell like home, land back is a an acknowledgement of being the other in your own lands. Mm. And, and it's hard and complicated, but it needs to be spoken because if it's left unspoken, then it's left unspoken about and unseen and un, unapproached. We need to voice these uncomfortable moments to start change, so like land back, be it in, in a white boy's bed, is just an acknowledgement of the power shift and the power dynamic and the space. Oh my God, did that make sense? Yes, totally. Okay. We've been having a lot of conversations about um, in my class, but I don't wanna focus just on my class because I'm sure there's other people here who are <laughs> interested in my class, but talking about um, the way you describe like mounting a white man or like kind of or am I reading too much into that or is the class reading too much into that like like no we, I love these is there is okay is there a delineation between sex as a political act or like you just want to pooch like that's what we want to know okay originally originally especially in book number one I wanted to cultivate and create a space for indigenous women to talk about sex freely, joyfully. Um, I wanted it to be as far away from politics and trauma, and the idea of sex as healing as possible. I was just like, sometimes a girl just wants to fucking talk about it. And I feel like two parts about it. I feel like A, Indian Love Poems did accomplish that. It opened a discussion, but also B, I was very naive. Uh, I was very naive. Um, we are Indigenous women. And if you're in any sort of brown body, it's a political act, even just being here. And then, of course, taking the narration and the control over a discussion of sexuality, another political act. Um, not diminishing sexuality, but acknowledging sexuality as something of a choice as opposed to something you have to do to provide for babies or provide for your family or provide for culture. Um, another political choice. And it was only as I kind of, I'll say, not necessarily grew up, but become more aware of my privileges, um, of the power that this discourse had that I was just like, oh. So I think Indian love poems especially is, is twofold. You know, sometimes it's just a fuck. But is a fuck ever really just a fuck? <sighs> That's literally like the whole point of my dissertation. Like seven years I've spent <laughs> on this question. <laughs> <laughs> We're brilliant. We're brilliant. But yeah. it takes the seven years to prove it. Okay. <laughs> at the at the outset, Tanil was like, "Yeah, don't go to don't go to enter into academia unless like you want to spend all your time in the library. But also, if you just want to see if a pooch is just a pooch, like like get paid to." to research and write about the ethics of and pooching. So sorry, I cut yeah. you off. Yeah, no, no, no. Like, honestly though, it's like, these kind of discussions, I always kind of laugh, like don't happen. I'll say at the grassroots level. You know, if I'm going home to the brass and I'm talking about like the power of an orgasm, my aunt is like, ish, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where is the holy mother? Like, this is not a discussion we're having. But it's super interesting to have them and trying to explain to like my family. And I have three brothers, like a dad who's, and they're all like hyper masculine, like hockey players, rock players, ball players. I love them, but they're problematic. And <laughs> like trying to explain to them that my dissertation is about. Indigenous women's sexuality, and that I literally get paid to go drive around and talk about sex. They're like, you're talking about porn. And I'm like, indigenous sexuality. <laughs> like, they don't get it. And it's so funny. <laughs> I'm just like, academia, man. It just opens up doors. It closes a lot of doors, y'all, but it opens doors too. <sighs> yeah. Going off of like what you just said, do you think? Um, either of you or both of you could maybe like go in a little bit more about how 
intimacy or romance is like inherently thought of as like sexualized like especially in like colonial context it's like when you think about being intimate or like thinking about being romantic with somebody it's like automatically delegated to somebody that you're in partnership with as opposed to people that might be like your family or your close friends or um, just people that you're in close relation to I guess, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of start on this, right? I think that there's too much of a emphasis on when it, when you enter into any type of intimate relationship with anyone that automatically assumes that there is an ongoing um, or romantic um, inclination, right? And, and Tanil asked earlier, like, is it okay just to pooch and not have that 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 aspect of like ongoingness or stability related to it right so I think that um it's important to it, actually I want to go back to study to what you're saying about this if for indigenous people and a lot of like people of color we don't have that privilege of having a sexuality that isn't mired by politics or sexualization or violence or harm, right? So if we think of black men, the sexuality is so mired in this like, like, like beast and this like harmful kind of player type type trope, right? Whereas if somebody was to like betray that trope, they would be considered somebody that is not actually a member of that identifying group. So if like, you know, an indigenous woman entered into relations that were like not um, mired by this negative identity that is like full of all types of really harmful tropes like Pocahontas and I won't, and I won't get too far into that then we're actually like not considered a member of that group. So if we enter into relate, we, we always have to fall under the Pocahontas, like letting white man take land because we want to pooch and all these types of things, right? When it's really not, even, well, well, the Pocahontas story is not even about that. She was, she was a young woman. But if we think about the meaning or what, what takes place or what, what um, the values associated with like these narratives of what it means to be an indigenous woman, um, who just maybe want to explore various relationships or various sexualities or various interventions into this like colonial heteropatriarchal narrative of what it means to be an indigenous woman in our own lands that's where I that's that's where the problems start right so I think that you know again going back to what to what your your question Felicity I always question if it's possible to have a sexuality that is innate and maybe spiritual and ancestral while the backdrop is this like ongoing tension of settler colonial management and order of particularly indigenous women's bodies so that's why I think Tanil's work is so um important just because it's like funny and deadly like like and I can relate to it there's that aspect but also that it's really like a power shift. Like it's like a way for indigenous people and, in, and indigenous women to relate to something that's not the specter of this like um, belittling or sexualization or micromanagement of our bodies. Like you could just punch, right? Like without a political like aftertaste to it. So having said political aftertaste, I'm just wondering, Tanil, like, like again, like, you know, I, I post this, pose this question, but can indigenous women in particular have sex without it having a, a political backdrop to it? Aww, pleasure. I wanna, yeah, I think I wanna delve kind of into pleasure and desire. Like, just, what do you think about that? Um, hold on. Can you hear me all right? My Wi-Fi is being twitchy. Yeah, no, we can hear you great. Yeah. We can hear you just fine, Tanil. Go ahead. Uh, as she freezes. Well, actually, no, now she's frozen. She froze. I think I jinxed it. Yeah, we totally jinxed it. Yeah. Just thinking of time, um, Felicity, are there people with questions? Oh, it's only 620. Yeah, it's, it's early. So. I haven't been monitored. Oh, there, she's back. We can we can see you again. Oh, she's on hold on. Oh, I think internet. 
touching. We are also like, you touched on it a little bit earlier, um, but Janie and I have been thinking a lot about like the hierarchies that are at play when we're in relation. And you guys did get into it a little bit, um, but I guess like something that like Janie and I were talking about earlier is again, like what Tanil was getting at was like, we're never really single. And when you consider like all the different people and like beings that you're in relation to constantly, then it helps with that. But there are times, you know, when it does get hard and you feel really alone. And I guess that's something that would be nice to hear either of you talk about as well as like, how do you combat the feeling of loneliness? Like if it does creep up, Tina said she fixed it now. So I don't know if that's something that you want to get into or um, we can go back to the idea of uh, intimacy and what you had posted. Yeah, I think, I think Tanil hit a really good point, right? Like there's this emphasis on being single is associated like with not being valued and not being capable enough, right? To, to enter into relation with others. But also, you know, I, th I think about singlehood a lot, but I also think about like multidom a lot. Like what does it mean to like enter into relationships with various peoples that that is of course consensual and like upfront and honest, but meets various needs too, right? So can you have, I, I, I'm, I'm posing this as a question, but I already know the answer, but like, can you have a long-term kind of common law partner, but then um, enter into relationships with other people that like, like meet certain aspects of, of your life and your needs that are, that are like anti-nuclear, establishment like nuclear family establishment um and I think about a lot of the ways that this resonates in Anishinaabe like storytelling like like the ways that nuclear family is meets the need of a certain power structure which is like capitalism right but how can we um be anti-capitalist or enact or behave as anti-capitalist when it when it comes into entering into relationships with other people and for some people like staying with an opposite sex partner or being engaged in a relationship that is like life lasting and and so on is like fine right <laughs> like that that may be their their goals and their ambition and it feels good for them but what I think Tanil's doing and what what I'm trying to explore and articulate is how can we um, enact a rebellion against these structures that have been imposed on our own bodies and our own communities and actually like meet the end of like a really violent and harmful objective of settler colonial like occupation? How can we turn against that by enacting relationships that go outside what's expected of particularly like indigenous women and two-spirit people's bodies? And again, that's why I think, you know, Tanil's work is so um, powerful in that regard. Like we have these conversations, like after we're reading your books, people are like, yeah, I read this. And it's like, so, you know, um, I want to say empowering, but I feel like it's even, it's it's like extra or super empowering is that it allow, enables us to like reimagine a future that's not mired by this nuclear um, regime or this nuclearly imposed regime. But again, that's always kind of coupled with, or what's hanging out in the background is like, yeah, but when we're having this like punchy little cute times, like, do we have to be political? And that's kind of what I always struggle with. Or does it always have to be marked by rebellion and resistance and resurgence? Or can pleasure be politically neutral? And can desire be politically neutral? my very pessimistic self <laughs> says no um but that is a person who has like spent the last decade of her life in academia in white spaces in unsafe white spaces and where I make a life going on stage and talking about how how proud I am to be indigenous and sexual and powerful, and on other levels to be a plus size sexual indigenous woman. That's a whole other layer of both ex socially acceptable scorn and hate. And so I say that from a place of acknowledgement of 
this is a life of both fear and aggression towards us, towards me, towards us, towards them. But, you know, slip back a decade where you're making out with your Métis boyfriend in the back of his truck. And, you know, Johnny Cash is on the radio. Like, is that political or is that just Indigenous love? You know, are you thinking about who the prime minister is? Or are you thinking about how good he's going to taste? And I think it just acknowledges that there's space for both. That yes, on one very primal level, this desire is ours and it's our gift and it's our gift to ourselves and to our partner at that moment. And it's beautiful and fun and crazy. And oh my God, I can't wait to go back and talk about it. But that doesn't negate the fact that we are still Indigenous people, that we're still BIPOC women, that we still live under an Indian Act. And I think it's the idea that we can exist, obviously, in multiple realms. And to take pleasure in those moments where we don't have to carry the burden of, you know, carrying on our people with our sexual partners (laughs) and just enjoy our sexual partners. So would you say that's the goal or end game of decolonizing sex, gender, sexualities, like just being able to exist in a moment that doesn't rely upon us having to reconsider our bodies in a sociopolitical violent sense? I think so. I think it signifies an internal peace. I think it signifies an acknowledgement of all the positions that we as women, as femmes have to carry, but also acknowledges that in this moment, we can breathe and trust in our partner and in that moment to let it go and to just be someone with a crush, someone with hot cheeks, somebody just waiting for the next moment. And I think having the space and the trust and the power to have those moments is something to be recognized and acknowledged and to hold up as this is us. Mm -hmm. So basically like to pooch, just for the sake of poonching is white privilege. (laughs) (laughs) It fucking is, okay? (laughs) So after an hour of circling around it. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. With um, with that, like, first of all, I have such, like, a warm feeling inside, like, with what you just said, like, um, about how, like, decolonized sex is, can be symbolized through, like, internal peace. Like, I think that that can be something that people can really take away from this, if anything. Um, But something that, you know, Janie and I were also thinking about when we're thinking about like expressions of love and how we can um, show that we care for somebody whether it's romantically or platonically and not to like reinforce that binary understanding but just because it's a language that's available to us um, which is something else is like how do we express love in the language that you know like um, that is so like limited that's something else we can go into um but we were thinking about like expressions and um you think a lot about like love languages I feel like that's something that gets used a lot nowadays um and there's like this hierarchy that's like placed amongst them and when Janie and I were going through um how we've been shown love like from our parents and like from our families and stuff like there have been different um experiences about like whether that love has been verbalized or whether it's been through like acts of service and then how that's like influenced our relationships and how we show love to other people um and so i guess something that we were like interested in hearing about from the two of you was what your view is like on like verbalized love versus or like with acts of service and like how you how you find you can communicate love authentically to those that are important to you. Hmm. Um funny story. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not a fluent language speaker, 
but my dad is in Denning. And for those who don't know, like it's this really like throat guttural tone based language. It's really hard to learn. And I'm awful at it. That's <laughs> the humble. And, um, but I was talking to him one day and we we're talking about this idea of like love, right? And my dad does not want to have these conversations with me. He wants me to like go and study and like pass my class. He doesn't want to sit down and talk about theories of love. <laughs> I was asking him, I was just like, dad, I had like this idea that, you know, this idea of love is a colonial idea and um, that it doesn't necessarily translate into our languages. So how do you say I love you in Dene? And he's like, well, the closest translation is uh, Naganita, which means I care for you. I take care of you. Because in Dene, love is action-based. Action-based, and I loved that idea because it, you know, it resonates and resonates. Um, don't mind the pun. Yeah. <laughs> next, next poem. <laughs> yeah, my next long poem. Um, because even as a poet and as a storyteller and as like a word person, words are cheap. You know, I have been lied to a thousand times. And it's only the actions that I feel like you can see the truth of a person. It's that saying, if they wanted to, they would. You know, I've, I've seen too many TikToks, but it's true. You know, somebody can say, I love you and fuck your best friend. Somebody can say, I love you and steal your money. Someone can say, I love you and leave you stranded at the party. You know, that's not love. And I really like this idea of action-based love so for me like I could live a lifetime without somebody telling me I love you as long as they showed Mm -hmm. yeah I agree too so you know so we're talking about like verbalizations of love and these acts of service and I often think about like like in those love languages can love be suspended based on the way that someone performs you know, um, performs love. So can I be in a long-term relationship with someone and we've built this family and like, maybe we have children together and we've had this like commitment, but what does it mean to like suspend love if those acts of service are not like adequate, right? What does it mean to like hold space for someone and to love them outside of this rubric or this matrix or this expectation of, um, high voltage, intimate, like passion and desire and so on. Right. So can we revisit love? So that's like, that's one of my like major kind of concerns is, and I think, and I think um, Tanil is touching on this is like, when you say you love someone, what is at stake there? Right. So you verbalize all kind gestures and you want to support everyone and you want to kind of like, not like negate, be be abusive and shit like that or gaslight anyone but what is the power of like a love that can be suspended at any given moment and then re-entered into or renegotiated or um consented upon based on the way we behave or the way that um we we reenact or enact intimacies with one another and can love be absent of intimacy And I really think that that's one of the like biggest questions um, that I try to think through in in my work is like, how does intimacy relate to this idea of love? Can we like cuddle with people? I think we can, again, again, I'm asking a question that like, you know, when white men go up to like the mics at conferences and they're like, I have a question, but then it turns into like this big, huge commentary to like uplift like all of their work and their research that was like relevant in like 1979. That's me right now. I'm the, I'm that white man. (laughs) So I already have like the answer to that question, but that's what I think is, that's what I think is important, right? If we're always like holding stake and we're always like, like holding on to this idea that once we enter into love with somebody that it's this like solidified everlasting 
always till the end of time thing, are we limiting the ways that humans and Anishinaabek and indigenous people can enter into these like sacred acts of being with one another that are based on desire and fulfillment and um, resurgence, right? And resonate really spiritually and, and intimately. So I guess, yeah, that's always my question at the work of like at, at the core of all my work is like, does love equal intimacy? Or is there another type of love that, or, or does, does, can we be intimate in like sublime moments or like very precarious moments without that assumption that we have to commit ourselves emotionally, physically, spiritually, sexually to like another, another person? I don't know. I get that. I get that from your work, Tanil. Is that we can have those moments of like intimacy that are not tied to something that inhibits our spiritual like transformation. As mm-hmm. we, and I think I think we're like when I think about those types of things, we're naturally moving into ideas of polyamory, um, polygamy. Yay! Now she's all like <laughs> national. Like, why'd you wait till fucking? <laughs> like, like, let's go. <laughs> So what do you think about polyamory? (laughs) Well, (laughs) I have spent like the last two to three years trying to convince like this Denny guy, like he's six, four, he's like six years younger than me. I don't know. I don't know. Call me an auntie and (laughs) you know, no kids. Oh, great job. That's another another, uh, (laughs) webinar. I know. I know. That's a whole other, that's a whole other question. But I've been like trying to convince him. I'm just like, you know what? Like, I, I can't be your only one and you can't be my only one. Like, I like you so much, but you're a problematic man. But I want to enjoy you for what you are. But I want to change you because that's not my job. <laughs> and like, real. Like, I can enjoy this and embrace it and desire it and want it, but not want it to be my one and only. So he wants to do that all. Like, and like, no, like, I am a catch, you know? I have my own job, I make my own money, I handle myself, I have a good home, you know, I have a car that's paid off. I'm a catch for him. And well, for him. And I'm trying to convince him, like, we need to open up our definitions of what relationships are. Because when we were dating, he was definitely seeing other women. And I'm just like, I'm not jealous. I just don't want you to lie about it. Like, I want us to be open. I don't need to know about Brittany. They're always white. I don't even know about Brittany, <laughs> but you know, I wish you well, and I wish you safe sex, and we're just going to keep getting pissed, like, and I was trying to, like, guide him towards this, because I'm like, you're doing it anyway, but you're just trying to call it cheating, but it's not cheating if I know about it and don't care, is it? I don't know, but it was really interesting, because this idea of polyamory was so foreign to him. It was more okay for him to lie and cheat than it would be to be honest and open. And I was like, that's fucked up. <laughs> that is really fucked up. And I found that repetition over and over with our men. And I mean, like, this isn't even a discussion I'm going to have with, like, John Smith. Um, <laughs> this is a discussion I was just trying to have with our brown men who... Big Dick Denny. Yeah. <laughs> I, have a, I have a type, okay? I have a type. And it was just so surprising to me that they would choose dishonesty and lying over and over. Maybe that's like my naiveness again coming in. But what kind of world are we allowing our relationships to reside in that our men would rather lie to us than be truthful? And you just you see it in other terms too, like if he you know, kisses a girl accidentally, not accidentally, he kisses a girl at the bar, you know, he'll lie, (laughs) and everyone will lie around him, instead of being honest about his mistake, not understanding that for a lot of women and femme people, and that it's the act of lying that's the actual betrayal. The actual problem, as opposed to, like, entering into another. Yeah, like, oh, you thought another girl was hot, you kissed her? That is a legitimate thing, like, I understand desire. I don't understand the desire to protect your own ass and lie to me. Uh But would it solve everything? I don't know. I don't know. But it'd be fun to try. (laughs) 
I'm just trying to change the North one man at a time, okay? <laughs> Honestly, this whole, I feel like this whole conversation could have been about polyamory. I'm not going to lie. Um, but, you know, in a way, like, could, it could, like, underscore the whole thing, I think. Um, but I'm, like, I'm, what you said, like, makes me think about um, a conversation that Kim Talbert had on um, All My Relations. And she said basically what you said is, like, especially with hetero people, they're much more comfortable with the idea of cheating than the idea of polyamory because mm-hmm. it's that like truth and almost like vulnerability that I think scares people. And um, it's, yeah. Carolyn just said something funny in the chat, um, but it's, yeah, it's like, I think people are scared to just be fully honest and open like with who they're in partnership with because I, and again, it like res, re, reverts back to this idea of jealousy that's like rooted in hierarchy and like ownership. And like, how can we like own this person and claim them as yours, even if you desire other people? It's like, well, even if I might desire the people, like I still want this person because I want to have them under my belt, which doesn't make sense. Because if you truly like love that person and like care about them, then you should also want them to be able to fill their desire. To experience joy. Yeah. yeah. And it yeah. comes also with that idea of, um, you know, you you can't be everything for one person in the same way that that person can't be everything for you. And so, yeah, yeah like what you said, I was just like thinking about that conversation a lot, um, just about like the comfort in lying as opposed to the comfort in truth. It doesn't make sense. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, Jasmine just said something in the chat, the amount of Valentine's Day merch with your mind written on it. Yeah, it's like this ownership. And in a way, I mean, I'm sure that this is like not like surprising to either of you but like if we're existing in like a capitalist patriarchal colonial society it's like where does the idea of ownership come from if it's like rooted in owning the land and like if women especially like women and femmes are like equated with the land then again like trying to own that um yeah yeah. Alex said I feel like our perception of love is rooted in private property and ownership yeah Mm -hmm yeah totally like if you think about marriage right so we think about marriage as this like ongoing stability for that relationship that we have between like capitalism and like labor that's what it is it's because you know and and I've asked my students I've asked you know when we talk about these types of things that marriage or that monogamous relationship that's codified in an act of marriage actually props up this really severe form of um of um patriarchy and paternalism and a power structure because then the system can rely upon your body to perform what it needs in order to like have this ongoing power um differential whereas if there's bodies who are kind of fluid and moving in and are dynamic and with these people at this time and maybe not tomorrow that really like um undermines the work of the structure that relies upon these bodies coming in check right or being in check and that's that's what I think and and performing in a way that um, enables that power structure to endure which and again I want I just want to emphasize that it doesn't mean that like okay we're going to be radical we're going to be you know like resurgent and all this so now we got to go like have relationships with everybody like if it feels comfortable comfortable for you to be in monogamous opposite sex like whatever it is relationship that's not to say that that is like like inherently a negative or bad thing that that is comfortable for some that's natural for some that's that's so on right but where the problem lies is if you're conflicted or if you're not entering into relationships that that enhance your being or encourage you to behave in ways that are like anti-colonial or decolonial and what have you right so can I go lay with um you know one of the last times I saw Tanil we just we just slept at a bed and ate pizza like it was awesome right like it was it was amazing like it was but but what does that but but if it's an outside like perspective like what does that sort of mean in terms of people are gonna be like oh you know blah 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 but I think it's I think what we need to emphasize is that it's okay to act outside of this expectation of what our bodies are policed and I don't want to even think I don't want to even just use the words like 
um, intended to perform, the way that we perform these bodies are actually policed. They're either rewarded or violated or harmed based on the ways that um, we are perceived or seen or read to others. So, so you know, yeah, that, that's my biggest question is sort of how this, these hierarchies and how this way of behaving with one another can be suspended for those who are intent upon um, having other desires. Or how, what's, what's the power kind of um, related to enacting other than nuclear heteropatriarchal um, ways of being? Mm -hmm. um, oh, he keeps saying suspended and I'm like, do you just mean like stopped? <laughs> because like for me like it goes back to this idea that like yes love is an action but love is a choice and I'm like a lot of people get really mad at this idea that love is a choice and um I was kind of explain it to my friends who are like going through heartbreak because that's the easiest time to explain it like but I love him <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to all my friends, um, but it's accurate. And I have to like, kind of like lay this down. I'm like, listen, I was like, every time that you start to think about them, do something else. Every time that you pick up the phone to like call them or text them, put it down, put a movie on or put your favorite song on. Um, your distraction is a choice, but the more that you think about it and ponder about it and remember it, the better it is in your head. And like this fantasy of who they were because at that point it is a fucking fantasy of who they were, um, you're going to continue to love that fantasy. And when we put ourselves in a position where we either don't think about them or we think of you know, a negative for every positive, oh, they kissed like a dream, but they had that, that. you know, oh, he always held that door open, but he also took my money. Uh, <laughs> you know, love is a choice and that doesn't mean like when we stop or suspend or stop or choose to stop engaging with that emotion, that it's not there. It's just that we, I feel, we stop giving it power to define our actions and our mental state of being and our spiritual health. There's nothing wrong with acknowledging like, I love this person and I care for this person, but this is no longer healthy for me or this is no longer valid in my life and I'm going to put it aside. But I don't know. I don't know. People think, like, I don't think that's crazy. I think this is just truth that we don't speak of. Mm -hmm. But I've been single for a long time, so I feel like <laughs> that affects how I think it's a little blurred. <laughs> <laughs> well it, it makes you think about like relationships really critically yeah. and about intimacy yeah and about sexuality and about desire and it's just it's very very interesting on this side because like as we all know like I'm still a very sexual sensual person with many relationships but at no point is this desire for a partnership there Hmm. Oh, and it just makes you feel like you're on the outskirts. It's a very trickster energy, like I said in the beginning. Trickster energy. Who's gonna come and like, like fuck y'all up and leave? <laughs> I feel like that's cook 'em energy too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, mm, mm. Oh, there's some questions. There's, Sorry, there's some questions. I, I'll, I'll make the note before going into them. Like with what you were just saying, you're definitely not on the outskirts. I feel like we're made to think that just because you don't desire like a relationship means that you're not, again, like fitting into how you're mm -hmm. gonna be valued within society. And I can relate a lot because like I never dated in high school and like early into university. And I think that that allowed for that like critical aspect to like develop where like I would see other relationships playing out. And I was like, I don't think that that's how it's supposed to like love is supposed to be shown, right? And so you, you kind of like exist at the periphery where you're still experiencing intimacy, but then at a different, like from a different position. Um, and it, the veil is like lifted to, so to say, of like, you're not 
you're not just experiencing it in like all of its bliss you know what I mean um there so we'll start with um where is it um, okay this isn't chronological but uh Aaliyah said where do both of you stand when it comes to introducing or exposing children to intimacy or sexuality only because of the debate surrounding sex education in schools as well as the quote-unquote don't say gay bill in Florida so I'm not familiar with that bill <laughs> I have to say right off the hop but I do think that um enabling children and you know I have three children and I, like I'm kind of like I call myself a cook mom because I have a really old child and I have like a baby so one day I went to my son I was like are you having kids anytime soon he's like no so I'm like well I'm having another baby <laughs> like I need to have just these little babies right but I th and I could see how kind of my way of raising my kids has has changed over time but what I've learned is that, and I learned this from my mom and I learned this from my aunties and I learned these from my grandmother was that there's no sort of shame. Like you have to erase the shame in any type of like thing that has to do with our bodies and has to do with, um, with the ways we enter into like sexual relations, whenever that's, whenever that's appropriate and, and, and consensual. Right. So I remember just being a young child and like, but, and this is uh, this is what I've learned to be like a Anishinaabe thing and I think it's I think it's familiar for like other um indigenous people but like uh, particularly women would walk around just naked like my grandma like like my aunties my mom and it was just sort of um not it, there was no I don't want to say normal because and natural because there's a lot of like things built into that and baked into what it means to be natural and, and essentialized but I didn't think anything of it, right? And I didn't think that there was harm in viewing um, various bodies, various particularly women's bodies in certain ways. And it, it, it was just kind of the way that I grew up. And then one time I had started going to school and in kindergarten and, you know, I guess it was ingrained in me that it wasn't, that women weren't meant to be around one another um, naked. And I came home and it doesn't mean that like everybody was just kind of like buck naked, but like, usually breasts and things out and and one time I said mom you should cover up and she just looked at me she's like she's like baby girl that's a white man telling you that and it was like really a long time before I could actually reflect on that was that I as a young child was sexualizing these women in my family that were like effectively working towards accepting these bodies and all their like various forms that just being naked or nude um, in, in various um, aspects was not implicitly sexual for Indigenous women or to be sexualized, but at a very young age, I was being indoctrinated into that, like, assumption that Indigenous women, women's bodies, and I started to, like, police that. Um, so I think that, you know, going back to that question, um, I am not familiar with the, um, with the bill in Florida, but I think that, um, I think that, uh, hold on, I had I had the thought on my head. I think that there's a lot evoked when we shame particularly women's bodies. And I only say that because there's a lot um, of violence that occurs on, on indigenous women bodies or, or people that um, present as indigenous women. When we, um, when we are the ones to evoke that shame upon them. So I start to think about, you know, what does it, what, what, what does it mean to like, and in this sort of, I don't know, environment and space and place and time that we're in, is it possible to kind of have that neutralization of that political harm that's been imposed upon Indigenous women's bodies? So at the end of the, like, to answer your question, if it's even an answer, is it's not so much introducing kids to like what it means to be to have healthy sexualities and have healthy understandings of the body I feel there's more of an importance on diminishing the harm and sexualization of people's bodies I feel that's where the power lies mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I really like that 
Um, like I've mentioned, um, I do have a daughter, she's 10. Um, but like what I didn't mention, I think a lot of Native parents will get this, is that my daughter doesn't look 10. She looks much older than 10. And people treat her much older than 10. And this happens with a lot of like brown and indigenous girls that our bodies develop earlier. And that means our bodies are sexualized earlier. And I did not grow up, um, well, I grew up like, you know, like a Roman Catholic community with your Roman Catholic parents. And so, and with three brothers. And so like my sexuality was not like pushed down, but definitely wasn't like embraced. Um, like womanhood, had very defined roles that fell under traditional, which is actually just, you know, key for patriarchal. And <laughs> I said what take I said. Note of, take, yeah, take note of that. <laughs> and um, me starts a war. Um, and when I was re like writing my two books, um, I don't think there's any mention in there of me being a mother or my daughter. Um, because in my mind, I couldn't, connect sexuality with childhood. I couldn't connect my motherhood with sexuality, which is so fucked up. And <laughs> I like writing those two books really made me think about what it means to be sexual and a mother, what it means to be raising a daughter, what it means to be a woman central home and what kind of work I'm going to have to do to negate the outside influences on that home. And, you know, it's, it's the most terrifying work I've ever done. And, you know, you don't even know if you're successful until later. Um, but as it stands, Ari knows, I'll say about my books, and she has my books. I don't think she reads poetry, <laughs> but she has them. And she's been in a position where she can either listen to these talks or she can, like, go and sketch. And she's been in a position where I have a very diverse friend list, of course, we all do. But, you know, she has trans aunties and uncles. And I think kids will really show us the way because not once has she misgendered them. Mm -hmm. Like kids see in a way that we don't. And I'm just like, okay, okay, baby. And the acceptance that she has for all these different definitions of how we express gender and identity and who we are and this solid understanding of like both her body as it develops. Cause like even yesterday she came up to me and I don't usually share stories cause like her consent, her stories is important. But um, she came up to me yesterday and she was in front of her cousin Ava, they're both the same age. And she's like, mom, what is this? And she shows me her hips and she has like stretch marks on her hips. I was like, oh, those are stretch marks. It's just cause your body is developing. And, you know, super neutral. Because it's like, whatever, I have stretch marks. And um, her cousin Ava was just like, oh, hopefully they go away. And I was just like, like, sis, you're 10. Um, like, where does this negativity come from? And so, like, I sat them both down because I was just like, listen, I was like, they're never going to go away. Our stretch marks don't go away. This is our body growing and giving us strength. And just having to, like, being like, this will happen with your hips. This might happen with your butt. This will definitely probably happen with your breasts. This might happen with your arms and your thighs and your back, and your knees, like, you know, along your back, if you grow any taller quickly, I was like, this is natural and normal. And it was just so humbling and eye-opening that these two girls raised side by side from like, cause her, my niece's dad is my brother. And to have such different viewpoints on their bodies already, I was like, oh, we got so much work to do. But I mean, <laughs> it's important work and it's beautiful work. And like when you get it right and you see it getting right, then it's like, okay, we have a bit of hope. We have a bit of hope for that future. <laughs> um, thank you so much for those answers. Um, our other questions. Um, hopefully we can get to them. We don't have like too, too much left, but if you guys are comfortable like staying on a couple minutes after seven, then we can try. But um, Jasmine had asked earlier, um, Jasmine asked earlier, um, how would you describe the role of femininity in the Dene community? And what might this have looked like pre-colonialism versus now 
to be next director twice to me. Ooh. Oh, you know, honestly, Jocelyn, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. Um, my community in itself um, was founded in 1906 when the treaty was signed and it was moved to that place because of the Hudson Bay Company. So where we're currently located was only put there because HBC wanted an outpost there. So even at that time that was HBC and then the church moved in right away and has such a chokehold on this community that femininity was defined within these Roman Catholic European traditions. So the stories that we hold or, or told about the old days are still told through this filter of Roman Catholicism and patriarchy. So I don't know and like, that's such a sad thing to say, but I do know like what roles that women played, you know, as mother, um, as caretakers of the home because they were nomadic people and the husbands were out following, uh, we had moose and caribou. So would follow them for weeks at a time. Like I know those stories, but was that defined in femininity? Was that even a concept? Um, I don't know, but it's a great question. Um, another question directed towards you, Tamil, is this was from Amanda, and they asked, "Do you feel the creative medium of poetry and photography allows for more fluid or open engagement in Indigenous resurgence slash sexuality?" Thinking, and then they continue and said, um, "Thinking traditional academia is a Eurocentric and gentrified environment that is restricted to non-white." Uh, restricted to white, male, straight, able-bodied people. Adding to this, how has academia responded to your work? Um, and because it's not traditionally viewed as legitimate, and I air quotes around traditional, but. Uh -huh. And they also said, by the way, you're a lovely, lovely human being and I adore your poems. Thank you. Um, I feel like the photography and poetry definitely allows me to explore this idea of sexuality in different ways than academia does. But like, let's be honest, at the root of it, it's stories. And that's what really I'll say gets me going is this ability of how we tell our stories about our bodies, about our desires, about our passions and what forms they take and how skillfully indigenous people take those stages and make it ours, no matter what format it comes in. And uh, photography and poetry, for me, has definitely allowed me, I'll say, to explore things in a more like smack dab kind of way. Um, but academia allows me to explore it in a way that lets me sit back and like look at my own actions and look at my people and my community and kind of point out, not the problems, but like where we can work on things. And it's just a different level of seeing story. Um, academia, <laughs> academia, I think is entertained by me, like white academia is entertained by me. Um, when my first book came out, I think I was a second year and um, I got invited to like the end of the year bash, whatever for our department. And then our department had this old white guy, a lovely person, whatever. Um, wanted to acknowledge like the published books in the department and he um invited like the authors up like all different men women and men of varying ages I was definitely the youngest one there and um but when he introduced me he's like and here's our sexiest author and that was like <laughs> it was wrong on so many levels right. and so uncomfortable and I realized it was just kind of like this power switch. And I was just like, this is ugly. And I've kind of felt that women and BIPOC academia have really like accepted, embraced and challenged me and caused me to think and engage with my own work in very different ways. I'm always, always going back after I like go to these talks and being like, wow. <laughs> Like, this is great. Um, but I feel like as a whole, 
academia, like, I don't think you'll ever see me in a published article, like, with three, like, blind peer-reviewed articles, you know, like, that's, that's not ever going to be me, and I don't want it to be me, so, like, even the different desires in academia kind of show that we're outside it, but we still belong. I don't know. I went off. <laughs> well, Nish, Nish Academia just loves you. <laughs> oh, I love Nish Academia. Y'all scare me. <laughs> um, Bailey also asked, and I think this this will be our final question, and um, I think it's more directed to Geraldine, but um, you're both open to answer it. Um, Bailey said, I would love to hear your opinions on how eco-eroticism relates to climate change, maybe as a way of combating it as an individual or as a community. It seems like a great way to connect and bond with the land and to understand what it needs to heal. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. So in the article I referred to earlier, Melissa K. Nelson's um, Getting Dirty, she actually says, like, if you're able to engage with aspects of the world around us um, in this way that that doesn't just um, assign these people with spirits with like okay so she she kind of prefaces this whole thing with eating a peach so I know I'm like go read the article you'll you'll understand it but she's like if you actually engage with what it means to like bite into juiciness and sweetness and have it kind of splash over your face without feeling like obliged to like wipe it away and to really engage with with the moments and the sensualities with eating a really juicy sweet um, vibrant peach if you can enter into that relationship with with things outside of like hu human worlds then does that mean that you treat that world differently? So as opposed to like assigning peaches and dogs and, you know, all of these like non-human, um, which are normally relegated to be like actors in the, in the backdrop of human living, if you can engage with these things on essences that are like extra human or extra, um, I don't even know what the word would be, does that mean that we change that world? So for Anishinaabeg thinking, like thinking about um, waters and lands, because we think about those waters and lands as describing themselves in a verb-based like function, that's how we come to understand the words that describe these lands. They're the ones telling us how to describe them. So like waters, um, uh, wind, sun, everything, like the words that we have in our terminology and our li linguistics and our vernacular is actually uh, humans relating to the land telling us how they want to be described. So if we think about eco-erotics um, in the sense of engaging with the world around us in a sense that like betrays the ways that um, maybe Christianity has told us to think about the world around us, then Melissa K. Nelson, and I think I would encourage others to think about, do we then treat those lands differently? Which is at the core, right? That's the core of like caring for the earth and caring for um, lands and waters and um, entering into intimate relationships with other than human beings. I do think that that's, that's definitely not an answer to climate change because there's a lot of people like messing that up. But I think it's a way for us to behave that um, acts in intimate relations with those lands around us. So we're always considerate of, of how to um, be Anishinaabe. Definitely. Um, is there anything else that either of you kind of want to touch on before we wrap up? I'll just say, because I want to give Tanil the, the final uh, words. Um, thanks everyone for coming. I think it was really important for us to, to gather around this on Valentine's Day. Um, Ali, your little pooch named Valentine, have to acknowledge them. <laughs> um, Ali has a pooch named Valentine. But uh, anyhow, really thankful. I miss Tanil so much. Like, we really need to to hopefully all of this means that, oh, another question that I have is what does it mean to like 
be intimate with people when we can't even touch each other we can't even see each other we can't snuggle we can't cuddle we can't do those types of things so so I think that this is like just been so amazing for me I'm really really motivated to um, keep thinking through this work and I'm so happy that Tanil was able to to share with us tonight and super miss you and I'll um miigwech. that's all I want to say Tenille. Yeah, thank you so much for putting this together, you guys. Um, super honored to share space again with Geraldine. Um, she's always been an inspiration and a teacher. And, you know, the last time we saw each other, I don't know who was the big spoon or the little spoon. But it was... <laughs> but it was nice. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and I'm just grateful to be here. It's been a really great Valentine's Day to spend with y'all. Yeah, I'm just, I'm going to say, I can't say thank you enough, but yeah, thank you for both of you for agreeing. Like, this was just so much more than I had hoped for. Um, and I'm really glad that we were able to, again, like, put this together on Valentine's Day. It's just, like, such a great time to be talking about this. We should be talking, I talk about this all the time, but, like, I hope um, something that people take away from it is that, like, we need to normalize, like, talking about these types of conversations a lot more often and with more people to like break down that that line of intimacy but yeah thank you just so much to both of you and thank you for everybody who joined us tonight and thank you for putting it together felicity and um i, I forgot the name but it's a sociology and anthropology students association right yeah, at carlton yeah, yeah. yeah thanks for all your hard work both yeah. of you and everyone else that uh, contributed to it mm -hmm. i'm gonna stop the recording now and then of it.